Welcome everyone to the Full Spectrum series. My name is Nick Valentino. I am an assistant director in the Hagem School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and I'll be your host for the series. Uh, this is the third year of the Full Spectrum series where we invite faculty to discuss and explain their fields uh, in an effort to inform and educate prospective and current students, parents, and alums uh, on the problems that engineers and computer scientists are trying to, to solve. So if you're watching this and you are interested in learning more about problem solving and engineering, you're in the right place. Our guest today is Dr. Andrew Berger. Uh, Dr. Berger earned his PhD from MIT. He is a professor of optics and uh, an associate professor of biomedical engineering. Uh, professor Berger also won the Gergen Award for Distinguished Achievement in Artistry in Undergraduate Teaching and the Edward Peck Curtis Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. Uh, professor Berger, thank you for being here. I know that you have many responsibilities on campus. Uh, so uh, thank you for helping us learn more about optics and optical engineering. Fantastic. All right. So a lot of the audience for this is, is perspective and uh, students and parents. So can you give us uh, an overview of optical engineering and let us know the, the important points? Yeah. So um, optics and optical engineering uh, are two very, very similar degrees here at the U of R. And uh, the, the field is basically the study of light. So we use there's all sorts of ways uh, that that light is relevant in our lives and in science and technology and optics covers absolutely all of that. It's way more than just eyeglasses. Um, that that often is the the, mo the entry point for students, isn't it? The they 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 under think of the short uh, scope of what lenses are. Yeah, yeah, right. Every most most people, if they've been if if a high school student's been exposed to optics at all in the classroom, it's probably been to have learned a little bit in a physics class about. Uh, how light goes into a lens and maybe focuses to a, a small area like a spot. That's that's typically the only thing that the student's going to come into the University of Rochester knowing. And it should be pointed out right away. That's fine. We 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 take people the whole way. They don't they're not behind if they haven't even done that in high school. So is this is this the biggest misconception? And, and what, what are some of the things that we can do to, to counter this? Uh, well, the yeah, it, it I think what we can. What we can do to counter the perception that, that optics is about eyeglasses is to make people think about it as light and think about all of the things that uh, that light plays a role in. And the, the easiest starting point for a student would probably be they're looking at a screen at us talking right now. That screen is, you know, something inside of it is generating light and something sophisticated is happening to decide which pixels are going to be which color. And then if you pull out your cell phone, you know, you've got a flashlight, you've got a camera, you've got lenses, it's all in there. Everything that's going on in a cell phone is, you know, something that an optical engineer has helped to put there. And so that's way different from just thinking about going to the uh, optometrist and, and, and getting a prescription and getting glasses. So uh, when talking a lot with families, um, both professionally and, and with uh, families that I know, um, you know, they're, they're looking for their children, especially the parents are looking for their children to uh, get something they'll, they'll grasp onto. And a lot of times I ask about, well, do they like math and physics? Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about how math and physics are such a, a component of optics? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a big component. Um, the, the, you know, light is, light has wavelengths that are very, very small. You know, they're like less, uh, you know, a thousandth of a human hair that, that, but maybe I said that wrong, but you know, very orders of magnitude smaller than, than looking at a human hair. And so um, we have to rely on mathematics and physical understanding a lot to understand what is coming out of our measurements. And we do things in optics where we move uh, laser beams by like a fraction of a, of a wavelength that we don't directly see that we see experimental results that that we interpret in that way. So it's super important that someone going into optics is not just able to sort of push the buttons, but is able to think about why is it what I'm seeing in my experiment or in my homework problem? Uh, what's going on? How do I make sense of that? So having a math and physics background is, is key to being able to do that. What are some of the other uh, components of, of optics that, that uh, people might not be familiar with? Oh, there's a lot. I have I, ha I have a whole list. Um, I would say that um, people may not realize that it's well. For instance, it's optics people who work on virtual reality and augmented reality sort of headsets. Those are very popular these days. Those are still really bulky, you know. So working on making them really light and flexible and making them bright. These are th that's very important. 
people have probably heard about quantum uh, technologies, quantum uh, cryptography, but especially quantum computing is something that people are hearing about in the news. That's also very heavily dependent upon using uh, lasers to precisely control systems that have the, the memory and the readout that are necessary to the quantum computing. So there's a sort of just two opposite ends of the spectrum of something very, very uh, optically applied, the the, the, the the headsets, and then something very, very fundamental and scientific, which is the quantum stuff. Uh, that, that makes sense. So can, can you talk about um, what it is like for students, uh, you know, like when they get to their senior year, they're considering, um, you know, they're, they're doing senior design, they're considering um, either industry or they're considering um, going on for an advanced degree. Can you talk about what that experience is like for students? The senior design experience. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a really interesting time for them. You know, they've, they've, mastered all this stuff in our curriculum. They they know all these different things about light sources and light detectors and the way light propagates from, from one uh, to the other. And then suddenly they get thrown into a totally unusual, unfamiliar situation where typically in our department, there are so many optics companies in the Rochester, greater Rochester and upstate New York area that we get real clients uh, wanting our teams of two to four optics students to, to work on something for them that that would be you know mutually beneficial. So suddenly you've got something that you're having to design, maybe you're having to fabricate, uh, maybe you're having to bring it out to the to the to your client's place and not have it get all jumbled up as you drive it out in a car. And uh, that process means that they're not suddenly just working on something for themselves. They're they're working on something for somebody else. Someone has expectations of them. So it's a real mini environment that's like working in a real company because you're you're going to be asked real questions like, hey, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? Why did you take this other uh, idea? You know, why didn't you communicate with me more? Or why why are you communicating with me too much? You know, I want you to just go and run run with your best ideas. So they get a real example. Uh, they 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 get a faculty mentor. So you got one of the us on the faculty is giving them feedback uh, on at the departmental level, and then they've got their client who's giving them feedback at the you know consumer level, and that's a very meaningful thing for the people who choose and mo like more than three quarters of our students uh, do choose the senior design option so that they get that chance to work on a team. Uh, it combines computer programming, fabrication, design, um, outside the box thinking, purchasing optical components and setting them up in, in an effective way. It's a it's a great experience and it, it runs the gamut from being super successful to just being a good educational experience that you sort of makes you want to do better next time. Do you think that that is like the deciding factor for students who choose industry over academia or vice versa, or is it done before then, do you think? They're usually, um, I don't think the senior design experience, it, it, it culminates so late. Uh, it really, as with everything that we do in life, you do it under the deadline. And so a lot of the senior um, design um, breakthroughs and, and uh, really comes in like, March and April. So I think by that time, students have already decided, you know, a couple of months before whether they're applying to graduate schools and they've probably had interviews for jobs. So that I don't think that ends up splitting things all that much. You know, our our and our our students who are probably about two, three, two thirds to three quarters take the optical engineering track and about the remaining amount take the optics track. And the only difference is whether they do senior design or if they do a research thesis. Those are the two main ways that they get out of our program. And so that that decision is being made earlier. It, it, they'll know they want to do the senior design thing or not before. Bef they'll be already they'll be already planning out um, what they want to do next before they really dive hard into the work of senior design. So for those who do choose either a master's or a PhD, um, mm -hmm. In, in optical engineering, what do you think the contributing factors are to that as opposed to the students who, who go right into industry? Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, optics spans the, the range of types of companies and at many companies, especially the larger ones, um, having some official credentials of a post-baccalaureate, uh, uh, post college degree, post-bachelor's degree, uh, can be the difference in terms of how much, um, what's the word I want to say, Repres uh, 
it's it can be the difference in terms of how much responsibility you're allowed to to be given at a company. So sometimes it's sort of out of your hands. If you're if you're wanting to work at an aerospace company doing satellites, uh, then you are probably going to not be leading a research group uh, uh, if you don't go for some advanced training. So that's one reason that people will choose to get a master's. Uh, it should be said that if you go to work for, say, an aerospace company, they might very likely uh, let you work part time on a master's degree that they will pay for. So it's not necessarily that you you can actually do both at the same time. In other words, that that's an that can be an option. Maybe they wouldn't they probably wouldn't start paying for your master's in your first year of employment, but maybe starting in year two or three, then they would see value to, that they would get out of someone who looks like they're going to stick at the company. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, of course, some people want to go on to the advanced degree because they feel that there's more that they want to learn sort of for the pure joy of the learning. You know, I wouldn't recommend that somebody do a PhD rather than industry because they want to make a particular product or they want to get good at a particular skill. Like that's a good thing to do while being paid at a company. But if you just sort of think, I don't feel like I'm fully foreign. I'm not really sure what I want to do. I want to see more of what's out there and I want to take more specialized classes and I'm willing to, then then you should consider a master's or a PhD just so you can open your eyes more and maybe make, be a, make a more informed choice about what kind of place you'd like to work for, whether that's industry or not industry. Some, some people, of course, will choose to want to try to become professors or work in government laboratories or be entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. So uh, in, in Ed Hagem's speech uh, that he's done during commencement, um, he talked about you know the next big wave and a, a lot of a lot of uh, 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 students will ask you know like what is the next big wave and I, and I say a lot of the students are not as familiar with optics um, you know it's it it can be a high paying job right out of college um, mm -hmm. and there are not a lot of optics programs so if you're looking for something even though optics especially at the college I mean it's relatively old at the college uh, it, it is what a lot of people might refer to as a big thing or the next wave of uh, of technology. What, what do you think about that? About what the next waves in technology are going to yeah, be? Yeah, within, within optics. Within optics, yeah. Well, um, I will, re I will, I'll, I'll, I'll revisit some of the things that I was like giving as exemplars before, because they, they are the good exemplars of this. So, but to dive in a little more, um, again, I had, you know, headsets, uh, virtual displays, augmented displays, there's there's really a, a, a revolution going on in miniaturization of optical components that, that really make a difference, especially if you're going to wear something on your head. Mm -hmm. So the people are making new materials that, that, that affect light in different ways. People are making new surfaces that are that are curved in funky ways that were not easy to fabricate until you know, more recent techniques for, for printing and, and shaping and, and polishing became available. So, so I think, I think that um, novel dis personalized displays are, are a huge area that, you know, maybe it's hyperbole to say that, you know, what glasses did for people who didn't have good enough vision back in the day, maybe it's too much to say that we'll get that, you know, as dependent as I am on my eyeglasses, I don't know, I hope maybe that people don't get quite as deeply immersed in their virtual reality headset but um but there is a sense in which that 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 may become the next thing that sort of you need in order to feel like you're keeping up with the rest of the world that you you, you need this extra source of help and information and um that's not going to happen unless lots and lots of innovations go there and i think everyone is going to want a, a, a comfortable flexible i mean especially if you think about eyeglasses that you know, the only thing we know that eyeglasses do these days is they may have sunglass sort of stuff built in when you go outside. So if you could have glasses that are mostly like this, like you're looking at my face, but it can also, you can click on like, okay, I can keep looking at someone, but I can also check on some piece of information. What is it I have to buy at the grocery store on the way home? Like that's something probably everyone's going to want to have in their glasses if they're wear if they're glasses wearers. So that's a big area. I mean, that's a, that's a really, really interesting experience. Um, and so, and then in terms of quantum, um, people are, you know, starting to create startup companies. Now they're, they're research labs and startup companies that are trying to make quantum computers. And right now, if you figure that if things grow exponentially, every cycle of research, you know, where things are growing very quickly for quantum and it's probably going to be quite soon 
that there are commercial uh, devices for doing at least certain types of tasks. And there's going to be lots and lots of jobs available because lots of places are going to be trying to, you know, hit it big uh, on, on making something that uses that, that does quantum computing. And um, not all of quantum computing is, is read out in terms of photon ones and zeros, the way we have electron ones and zeros for, you know, non-quantum stuff. But I do think that every quantum technology is going to use light in some way because it's the most natural way to reach into, let's say, an atomic system and pull out the information. Like you can't go in and take a pair of tweezers and pull the, the atom out and ask it whether it's a one or a zero, but you do that with light. So there's going to always be a need for, for people making lasers, um, focusing the light very precisely into special dom specific domains of the, of the memory system of this quantum computer. So I think those two areas are both going to be very, very big. The one of them is very commercial. The, vir the virtual reality thing, you can go out there now and start having a really fascinating career with tons of major companies, you know, the big players, the Googles, the Apples, um, the Facebooks, they're, they're already doing this stuff. Quantum computing, that's more, uh, that's a little further out, but it's going to be a, I think it's going to continue to be a thing that, that really tries to work uh, at really hard. I mean, right now we have a satellite orbiting the Earth that it was launched by a country that's not the United States, and it's able to download unbreakable codes uh, down to the Earth so that people can then have secure communications with no fear of being intercepted without you realizing it. And the U.S. really got going once it learned that other countries could do this and we weren't doing it. And so you can, I think there's no question that quantum technology is going to continue to be a major focus of the U.S. government. And so since everybody who's going to the U of R is like, at least right now, doing something associated with the United States, everybody should be interested in, in whether that's something that they can join the wave of. Which of the, which coursework in, in optics, in, in optical engineering, um, I know we the students who do the introductory course um, and then the courses after that, you know, what is the intention after they get to the ground base of, of what optics or optical engineering is? Um, what do you then go on to to sort of to sort of foster their uh, their growth and then what options do they have going forward in different directions within optics? You mean like once they've gone through like the most intro of our classes, like what kind of things happen to them in their sophomore, junior, senior year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a whole sy uh, system uh, where in the first year they they get this exposure. But then once really sophomore uh, fall you know, the beginning of sophomore year is when they start actually taking the committed classes associated with the optics degree. Like the first required class for optics is really taken in that, in that sophomore year, the beginning of it. So, so that's a good thing also for people listening to know that, that you don't have to have done anything particular to optics in your first year. Uh, if you want to become an optics major, you have to keep up with introductory math and physics. And that's advice that I'm sure uh, any student will get, uh, regardless of whether they're in the optics program in their first year or not. But um, so but then what do we do in the sophomore year? We start off by bulking you up on how imaging systems work with lenses. So, you know, a telescope, a microscope, the the lens on your camera. So we they they they, they learn about how to send light through a bunch of lenses and, and off of reflecting mirrors such that it can comes to a focus and you get the kind of images we associate with on the, on our retina and on our cameras. Uh, so that what we, we call that uh, geometrical optics or ray optics, where you think about a bunch of beams of light that sort of converge on a spot and that makes a bright spot on the paper. Uh, but then we sit with them. Uh, people also realize that in fact, light uh, is an electromagnetic phenomenon. So the next class that they take, they start realizing, oh wait, light also diffracts, light spreads out. It's not just a bunch of arrows. It When it goes around a corner, some of the light sprays around that corner the same way sound does. So we give them an entire class on understanding light as a propagating wave. So they, 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 they learn about uh, diffraction effects. Light goes through a series of slits, a grating, and that spreads the light out and sends it in new directions it wasn't going before. So they, so they, learn, about, they learn about light as a wave. And then the third part of that process is that light is not, um, well, just like electrons are, are you can have you can't have half of an electron. You also can't have half of a photon. So there are some uh, properties of light that are really intrinsic to the fact that 
it is a an on it's a, a photon it's a quantized particle and that means that it has has certain types of behavior that are only explainable using quantum theory so our students also take a kick a class where they learn about how photons are used in the context of quantum applications so they 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 learn about the fundamental experiments that were done many of which were at rochester um decades ago to understand that when experimental evidence that when you sh shine a light beam at very low intensity onto a beam splitter, the light only blips at one detector and not the other one, and never at both at the same time, or almost never at both at the same time. So they, they learn about the quantum nature of light. So we go from the, the, the rays to the waves to the photon, and they, they do all three of those things during their, their, ex their experience. So that's sort of the understanding level, but they also learn a lot about applications. So they they start taking classes in when you have an image and it's not perfect, why is it not perfect? Like what are the distortions that are in optical systems and how do you correct them? So that's a that's a very applied field that, that they need to work on. And they learn about how lasers and LEDs and other kinds of light sources are, create, are, um, are fabricated and what their properties are and why they're not all identical to each other. And also detectors, like what there are many types and types of detectors that play a different role depending upon what wavelength regime you're working in and what you want to do with that light when you detect, detect it. So they learn about op optical instrumentation at, at that level as well. So there's a, and then they of course have a lot of, the other, the, the third part of the, the thing is in addition to understanding the fundamentals, understanding those, those uh, core applications, they have a lot of technical electives they can take. And most of our students choose to take their technical electives in optics because we have classes on color, we have classes on lens design, we have biomedical optics uh, classes. We have lens fabrication classes. We have optical system, a uh, lot, lot, lot of classes that involve computer-aided design. So CAD sort of skills that people can build up that, that let you flow directly into industry where they're gonna also want you to have those skills. Um, so I'd say that, that that's sort of a, a large flyover of what the experience is like for the optics student going from just having taken the intro 100, 100 level class to sort of, getting really uh, trapped in the major and taking everything. <laughs> it is robust, so that's good. I mean, it is good that they yeah. have that many options. Um, is, uh, the rest of the questions that I have are, are more about you. Um, okay. Is, is there anything else that you wanted to share about optics before we, we switch to the questions? Um, you know, we've, we've um, I guess I, I have I have a mental list uh, that I could say about a few other things that, pe that people do in optics. So maybe people would be interested in hearing a little bit about uh, Things, things in optics that that, that come up in, in in careers. I guess that that's that's one thing I, I should mention. Um, so there's a whole. I mean, I think about. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just make sure that I can access my uh, my little list here. So so um you know so we study a lot about color. You know, color is a major thing. You know, you want your screen to show you a picture that looks as if you're just looking at it under natural daylight, and that's non-trivial to do that. So. Screens are important. Um, there's there's uh, another big thing that people should know about that's been in the news a lot is the James Webb Space Telescope that went out into you know into far away orbit uh, recently. So uh, we have th whether you are working with looking out into the universe uh, or if you're looking back at the Earth from an orbiting satellite, there's just a lot of telescope work that's that's really important you know we we take for granted all these satellites orbiting above uh, in low earth orbit they're helping us communicate with faraway locations and so that involves a lot of light and a lot of signals being sent around uh, i don't want to let people walk away without realizing that there's a lot of amazing eye research that happens at the university of rochester and that uh that's a super important area of optics we have some world experts in in that uh here at the u of r and we have a whole center for visual uh sciences and that is, um, there are amazing discoveries that are, that are made all the time. The eye is amazing because you can, it's the only part of the brain that you can look directly into because the retina is actually part of your brain. It's a neural thing. And so that, that's an area that a lot of people, uh, especially our PhD students often go out into. Uh, I work in biomedical optics, so I can't leave without saying that, that a lot of biomedical applications exist that you might not realize. A lot of people listen watching this have probably had a little clip put on their finger or their toe. Um, anyone who's a, a, a parent who's given birth has certainly probably had their vitals monitored that way to get their 
the oxygenation level and their pulse monitored continuously. So there are a lot of different uh, amazing microscopy and sensing techniques that are that are used in human health. Um, if your baby was the one of uh, like the six out of 10 full term infants that were born with a small amount of jaundice, a little bit of yellow uh, coloring in their face that maybe got treated, like that's another thing where there's an instrument that they can put on your forehead and it can sense whether or not you are jaundiced enough to for us to need to take action for you. Uh, and of course, maybe another thing to, to say is that remember, some of the things almost seem like bread and butter at this point, lasers, you know, we have enormous and small lasers, they do a million different things for us. And uh, there are always are needs to build better, faster, more powerful, more compact, shorter pulsed, more durable lasers out there. And um, another thing that people almost take for granted is that light travels through communications fibers, telecommunications, optical fibers. And so that's a huge area where people are trying to figure out ever more clever ways of putting ever more information down an optical fiber so that you can get um, you know, faster delivery speeds for your, your, your broadband and stuff like that. Uh, and so tons and tons of things like that. The other thing I should I should say is that I want people to know that um, although you shouldn't be choosing an optics undergraduate degree uh, because you're confident that that's the best way to get a job, I will say that optics is an amazing field. We, I have a you know a, 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 a PowerPoint slide I sometimes show that says you know it shows a big fish in a medium sized pond, and that's what our students are. There there are not that many um, programs in the country that teach optics at the full bachelor's level, I and mean, there's only a a handful of these programs in the country, I would say still, it's probably really, even if I'm generous, it's probably fewer than 10 colleges in the country do this. So that's the small, that's the medium sized pond. And, and our students are the big fish because they are so well trained in this field that when companies want to hire people into bachelor's level jobs, they are looking at us like the way the rest of the, you know, country looks at places called Harvard and Stanford, because signs of overall excellence are what Harvard and Stanford stand for. The University of Rochester has this Harvard of optics right here. There's no program better than it in the whole country. And there's so many optics jobs, they can't all be filled. I mean, that that that's a, it's a sort of a national problem. There's just so many jobs out there in optics. So I am not joking when I say that every single one of our students who, you know, keeps you know, hews straight to the path and like takes all their classes and, you know, does a decent amount of working. But even if they are uh, a non-stellar grade point average, if they are keeping the minimum GPA of a C in order to, to get their degree, they will get hired. And I'm not talking about randomly, you know, at some odd place. Like I, I know students who have not been our top flyers GPA wise, who are working at Apple and Facebook now, for instance, and making obviously more money than I am right now even though they're 20 years younger than I am. So those are things that people should also know about the optics program, that it is incredibly well connected. We have 53 companies coming to interview our students um, starting tomorrow and starting today and tomorrow of the day that this was recorded. And they come every semester, these companies do, so they can interview our students to hire them for internships and summer co and, and co-ops, summer internships, co-ops, and full-time employment. A good number of our students do end up taking full-time employment um, at the companies that are in our industrial associates program. So it's an incredible, incredible uh, asset for 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 your students' um, opportunity to to be able to participate in the in the way that we expose people to real life companies that uh, that want our students. Yeah, I mean the demand is 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 amazing. Having while we do have, uh, you know, students who utilize Career Center, and you know, it is amazing how, I guess, not easily because I know it's complicated to organize, but how easily it is to get companies to come here to try to meet our students because their talents that are in optics, or if there are transferable skills that they are learning in optics to work in different other different areas, uh, the demand is is something that has been a wonderful to see. Yeah, yeah, it's it's totally true. I mean, it's it really it's just it's worth their time. To fly one or two people from their company out here because then that's what better way is there for them to talk to like 10 to 40 students you know however many they get interviews on um it's just financially efficient for them to do it this way so as i said before like a lot of the, the full spectrum viewers are either prospective students or parents 
of prospective students, you know, we wanted to learn a little bit more about how you got here and mm -hmm. more just sort of out of your outlook of, uh, you know, the, the college experience uh, as, as an optical engineering uh, student. So I'm going to go back to when you were a senior in high school mm -hmm. or a junior. And, and were you at that point, did you see yourself, you know, the idea of becoming a professor or did you see yourself uh, thinking about working in, in engineering because your you're undergraduate and your uh, master's degrees are both in or your PhD are both in physics. Mm -hmm. so, so as an 18 year old going off to college, can you talk yeah. a little bit about your thought process? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, if if you're the student listening to this, I had no idea where I would end up um, coming, starting off college. I, I would say I had maybe two ideas in my mind. Um, one of them was that I really liked um, my, I mean, I liked all my, I liked science and math stuff, sure. But I, I specifically was, found myself really looking forward to taking physics, which in my case, I took as the, for the first time um, as a senior in high school. So just in time to think about it when applying to college, really. Um, so I knew I liked physics. I, I knew I thought it would be a, an enjoyable thing to study more at college. The other thing, though, that I knew was that all of my most positive connections and associations and experiences in high school, all my high points were all in the music and theater arts part of my high school and my, my public high school in Lexington, Massachusetts. So I did not, uh, if someone had told me, look, I, you'll you'll be financially okay through your life, do what you love to do, I would not be sitting here talking to you uh, as the 18 year old turning into me because I would have turned into someone who just had an acting career because mm -hmm. that's that's what I thought was the most enjoyable activity I knew how to do. So I didn't do that. Um, you know, it's a, those are good hobbies to do and I still do them, but I, uh, that's what I knew as an 18 year old. So I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to be a teacher type until I saw a pamphlet, uh, uh, you know, one of those pieces of paper that they post on the wall back when they used to do things like that. So I saw one in <laughs> sophomore year of beginning my sophomore year of college that got, got me interested in volunteering at, um, at a high school uh, as, you know, a helper teacher type person in a science club. So that was my, that was my realization, like, wow, I think I want to help other people do the things that I had an enjoyable time doing when I was younger. And, um, and I didn't know that research was in my future until I sort of went to graduate school to learn a little more about physics and ended up doing some research that was meaningful to me. Uh, and that was biomedically related. It was, if anybody out there has diabetes or has somebody who knows diabetes, I was working on trying to shine a laser into blood specimens, uh, tubes of blood that you would you know have drawn you know, in, in under natural conditions and uh, trying to measure the amount of glucose in the blood with the hope that someday there would be a non-invasive way of shining uh, a laser beam on your finger and, and measuring the blood glucose. So that's how I ended up where I am, but it came later. It's not something I knew as an 18 year old. Um, I, I have a, a, a friend who's a professor uh, at DePaul and she says how much her acting experience uh, coincides with having to teach. Right, that there, there is that. There's always a, there's an element of acting within teaching. Yes, there is acting and there is improvisation. Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, the classroom does give that 18 year old um, stage guy um, some chance to to at least connect a little bit. Although obviously the the focus is in t is 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 very very different. The more I can shut up, the more learning is probably happening. <laughs> but sure, fair enough. <laughs> the uh, uh, you know you've had all this demonstrated success uh, being a, a professor in teaching. Um, we have a lot of students who, when we ask them what they want to do here, is uh, they want to save the world, right? Uh -huh. So with you know, I guess both in teaching and working with research with students, how do you think optics could save the world? How how do you think if a student who comes here who wants to try to save the world, yeah, optics is the way forward? Um, how do you think that a person like that could start this? Probably the biggest way that an optics person can save the world is to realize that ultimately almost all of our energy comes from the sun. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to uh, har harvest energy in a sustainable way, um, ultimately that's coming from the sun. So you can't 
harvest that unless you have the ability to manipulate and uh, light and, and convert it into probably electrical or other types of storage. So, you know, people are probably aware that there are, so the things that optics people are working on, you know, they're, they're not necessarily called optics, but if you are trying to make uh, novel materials that absorb light efficiently in wavelength regimes that, that say our eyes don't absorb very well, then you, you, you're, th you're doing an optical thing. You're trying to figure out how do I make a better solar cell that absorbs a higher fraction of the light that's impinging on it? If you want to uh, focus light using, you know, arrays of mirrors or curved surfaces that will focus lots and lots of light onto some sort of target so that it will heat up. And then that heat provides what ultimately does the work to get you the electricity or the storage of the energy. Again, you're, you're, you're taking sunlight and converting it over. So I think the short answer is, uh, that's that's what it is. Solar energy is the way to our our future. For it, it, it's all coming from the sun, so we we need to be as smart as we can about that. And that and it's so it's 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 both it's the materials, it's the way you get the light to interact with those materials, and then it's how you read out the energy that you've gotten from that interaction of light and material. Right, and that is certainly a way to save the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have one more question in terms of uh, the, the, I guess it's UR students, but also college students in, in general. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you think in the past 10 years or so, uh, undergraduates have changed, uh, specifically, you know, first year undergraduates? Are there any, are there differences? Uh, and if there are, what do you think they are? Yeah, when we sit, when the professors go sit around and talk about this, uh, one thing we uh, one one thing we all have learned is that when we were in college, we had to a larger part of what was that we were trying, what the, our professors were trying to do to us was to have us be able to carry around in our head mm -hmm. a, a lot of information so that we could draw upon it. The same way that you need to have a lot of language skill in your head, it doesn't help to have a book next to you and every. Every time someone says anything, you have to translate what it means. So they were trying to do that with us, say, with our math skills and our history skills and our science skills. And we now have to, we are now adjusting to the fact that students do not have to memorize as many things as we did. There are more things that you can get at, you know, big, complicated things are accessible in a way that they weren't when I was in college. So uh, that's a way that students are changing, that they... Um, that there is a much more of a feeling of why do I have to learn all of these details? Because I can look it up anytime I need it, right? I'm never going to need, you know, I'm not going to be in a crowded movie theater and need to know th this formula. And so <laughs> it's always going to be something where I can just grab my phone and I can get the formula. So, and I think that's something that both the professor and the student, um, should both be partners in recognizing what's going on there. Students should be articulating, students should be sending professors the message that um, please give me something in the classroom that I can't get somewhere else. And increasingly a really clear lecture um, deriving in my case, for instance, you know, uh, proving that disturbances of electrical fields are propagated the speed of light in vacuum through empty space, you know, things like that. Uh, that really, really clear lecture used to be something that you couldn't just go find on your own. You needed to go to college and have someone deliver that lecture. And then you had to take notes because then the lecture was gone. Yeah. So these are just not true anymore, right? You don't need to go to college to find a really, really good lecture about that topic and zillions of other topics. So students, if you're the one listening to this, you should be fighting to take the classes where the professor provides extra value for you in the classroom that you couldn't get elsewhere. And if the, the professor is always reciting things that you think you could find elsewhere, you should think hard about whether you're being instructed in the best way. And sometimes you have no choice and you have to take a certain class because it's required. But um, I would say, generally speaking, that's that's the biggest change that we see, that the fact that you that what you need to gain from your professors is different and it's excitingly different because you don't we don't have to waste time on things that you probably 
can look up again sometime later. So we don't have to make it a permanent imprint in your brain. We just need to tickle you and say, there's this thing that I talked to you a little bit about in class. If you need it in the future, you'll know that it's out there. Go look for it. Let's move on and talk about things that the internet's not going to teach you. Yeah, I, I, that permanence is, is uh, I, I have younger children and when they try to explain them about something in the past, like, let me see it. Like, I don't have any record. It, you know, it might be a, might be at uh, your grandparents' house. I don't know. And, yeah. and, and part of being as a student of being able to access this, uh, you're right, is exciting because they can move on to the application of things, I think, which they're mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, intent on. I think that they're very much into well, how does how does this translate into real life? Ultimately, is and I'm like, yeah. what well, all does it all is all real, but you know, some of you have to learn. So um, it, that makes total sense, uh, especially as being uh, both a growth area and an obstacle. Um, yeah, yeah, it really it really is both. I, I mean, right? We have some students who just want to start making things with their hands, or there's yeah. students who just want to do things uh, on the computer, and we and everything in between, and um, there's something there's something for everybody uh, certainly in this field there is and it's just but it's you know every generation of teachers has the problem that they probably should be teaching a little differently from the way they were taught but I think it's that's just gone into hyperdrive with the way information is now more freely available in a way that it just wasn't before so yeah keep your eyes open everybody make <laughs> make sure that you're um, that we are adding value wherever you go to college, make sure that you're getting added value uh, with what's happening in the classroom. And it's not just a recitation of something that's probably said better uh, by something that's on the internet. <laughs> uh, so, you know, at, at heart, I will always be an advisor and therefore I love hearing other people's advice. So what type of advice would you give somebody, especially a prospective student who just watched this and then wants to get uh, more information or interested into optical engineering? Mm. Yeah, I want to get more into that. Well, okay, so what I, so we are fortunate enough in optics that we have two really great um, professional societies, uh, not just one, but two. So uh, one of them is, and so they both have websites and those websites are, are great portals into to finding out more about about all sorts of things in optics, and so the, those one of those societies is uh, is called Optica, so it's like optic with an A at the end. And uh, if you've got a a parent or someone older who has uh, heard of them as the Optical Society of America, that's what they used to, to be called, but they recently changed it because after all, it's really an international thing. So they felt that it was more appropriate to scrub away. Uh, the America part. So now they're Optica. And uh, the uh, and I think their website is something like optica.org. And then the other one um, is a, another international society and the letters come from French, so they don't come out in the right order for thinking about it that uh, in English, but it is the S-P-I-E. And uh, the P is for like photon and the um, S is for society. And I think I, 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 I don't remember exactly at this moment. <laughs> So I think the E is for engineer, but anyway, <laughs> instrumentation may be the I. So SPIE.org is the other one. Uh, we have chapters of, we have student chapters of both uh, SPIE and Optica here in the optics department. Our graduate students and undergraduate students are both involved uh, in, in, in one or the other. And uh, that's a great way for you to, to learn more about optics. It's both of those places are very aware, uh, have very good web pres presences, have lots of different things that they'll take you down. Lots of um, hip, you know, ambassador students who are your age or a little bit older with torn jeans and things like that, telling you about all the cool <laughs> things that optics can do. So, so you'll um, you'll definitely find a home there, and um, a lot of activity kits and things like that as well. Well, that's excellent. Dr. Berger, thank you so much for your insight and for, for spending time with us. Um, we're going to wrap up with the, the full spectrum series. We'll return uh, with other areas such as biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, and much more. So please feel free to share this video uh, on behalf of the Hagem School. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you soon.